This is a documentary about an unheard of, for the most part, geodetic survey that decisively changed the shape of the Earth forever. It involves two men in particular, one an eccentric self-proclaimed messianic visionary who was adamant that the Earth was a concave sphere and the complete universe was contained within it, and the other, an ingenious geodesist, among other trades, who invented the contraption and headed up the survey. The results were shockingly in their favor, and to this day, shamefully, scientific man has done all in their power to wrongfully dismiss them and file their treasures of geodesy in the dusted shelves of pseudoscience. Therefore, I felt compelled to vindicate the name of these two men and to bring back attention to this perfect geodetic survey to educate the people into the knowledge of this geoverse that we live in and also to expose and repudiate all the workings of man's science falsely so called. Ladies and gentlemen, a line has been drawn in the sand, an invisible line that will never be erased. There's a trick of the eye Due to the crystal ball in the sky I bet the tourists and visitors to Naples Beach, Florida have no clue whatsoever that the very sand they sunbathe and run their surfboards across is the very sand that supported the one-of-its-kind rectilineator experiment over 118 years ago that conclusively determined the upward curvature to the Earth. They are also probably completely uninformed of the man Cyrus Teed who headed up his religious commune called the Koresh in Unity just minutes away in Estero. He called himself Koresh, which is Hebrew for Cyrus and believed to be the seventh incarnation of Christ. Some of his theories and practices I personally wouldn't want to repeat, say if I were the eighth or ninth incarnation, but it is his geodetic premise that we are on the inside surface of the earth, which is to me what matters. Koresh said, upon the assumption that the surface of the earth is convex, there has been predicated that prodigious fallacy the Copernican system, which, according to the admission of its most enthusiastic advocates and adherents, does not contain a single positive proof of scientific accuracy. Just think of all the advancements in space technology since he stated this in his book The Cellular Cosmogony back in 1898. We supposedly went to the moon several times and even landed a rover on Mars, even landing craft on comets supposedly millions of miles away. As we continue to spin, around a relatively small and insignificant blue ball going at over 1,000 miles per hour, while an enormous sun at 93 million miles away is toasting up our little ball at just the right temperature to keep us cozy. And of course, as our solar system is just a menial speck in our galaxy, which itself is speeding along at a kajillion miles per hour. But please allow me to backtrace a bit. At the end of the Crescent's very successful rectilinear geodetic survey, showing that the curvature of the Earth was not convex nor flat but concave, they fully expected nothing to halt their progress of completely overturning the modern Copernican system of cosmology. Professor Ulysses Grant Morrow, friend of Teeds and member of the Unity, was the geodesist that invented and conducted the rectilineator experiment. He said in the Chicago Times-Herald on July 25th of 1897, after the results that, nothing can impede the progress of the correction system. It is invincible. The world cannot long withstand the forces of the absolute truth, having for its foundation the indisputable facts of the greatest discovery of modern times. The facts we have observed and the lines we have surveyed demonstrating the Earth's true form 
are susceptible of test. We challenge contradiction, but our challenge will have to be answered upon the field of contest. And so, to this day, that challenge to reconduct the rectilineator, openly at least, has gone unmet. There's got to be a good reason for this experiment never being retested by anyone, ever, at least publicly. What is that reason? Is it because we already know that the Earth is a convex spinning ball, so why bother? But how do we know this? There are many reasons to believe it isn't. What could possibly keep the curious scientist from obeying the coveted law of the scientific method in which they uphold? Test and retest, test and retest, test and retest. Um, where's all that testing and retesting? Don't you think that is slightly hypocritical and telling? Their silence is their admission. Ever since I discovered and believed in concave Earth reality back in 2003, it was the reading of the results of this exact experiment that was the determining factor. I wanted to shout this to the masses. I wanted to tell my friends, my family, everybody. But aside from my small boys at the time, what I received was rejection, alienation, ridicule, and contempt. It's been a very bumpy ride since as well, but I press on because I feel Cyrus is watching over me waiting for me to come of age, waiting for me to faithfully and beautifully disseminate his message of concavity to the world. I get choked up about the injustices committed against him and against Yuji Moro with the suppression of the experiment. And if it is mentioned at all, it's only the sullying criticism of the apparatus itself. Their information is completely blacklisted and to the majority of the public, never even heard of. The online Google digitized version of his book, Cellular Cosmogony, was taken from Robert Schadenwald's collection of pseudoscience. And of course, if you are familiar at all with the rectilineator experiment, and were worried that it might possibly be true, you looked online to find physicist emeritus Donald Simonick, who has an outdated website containing all the so-called crackpot scientists. Simonick supposedly debunked it. I had an email exchange with Mr. Simonek back in 2003 when I first became aware of concave Earth reality. He could not rebut my assertion that his critique was subjective and merely only guesswork. You see, he claimed that the beams of the apparatus must have been sagging ever so slightly to skew the results in favor of concavity. But like the empirical scientist he is, holding true to the scientific method to test and retest, Donald applied for and received a grant for research from his university to build again the rectilineator. Because of his scientific and intellectual honesty, he was determined to, as Yuji Moore would say, hew to the line and let the chips fall where they may. Well, no. Donald did nothing of that sort. Instead, Donald pulled out from his toy chest up in the attic an erector set and constructed it in such a way to show how the beams could have sagged. However, I'd speculate that not his university, someone perhaps within the shill department of the government, gave him funds for his cutting edge research regardless. They possibly even paid for his trip down to the crushing library archives to look for original data notes from Morrow. Who knows for sure? Sadly, if he had spent more time being a real scientist instead of an investigative journalist, he would have earned more respect from me. He uses the word remarkable to describe that the experiment projected an accurate 25,000 mile circumference of the Earth. I used the word remarkable to find that his readers can buy his illogical beam sagging explanation. The beams would have had to sag just enough, not one ten thousandth of a degree more, not one ten thousandth of a degree less, to calculate the accurate roundness of Earth. But what's even more worrying and telling is the deception I see in Simonek. 
In my opinion, he spent a considerable amount of calculatory energy to distract the reader in hopes of not having them investigate more on their own and find out that he intentionally omitted the return survey data from the record log on his site. Of course, if you delete something and want to hide crucial and imperative information, you need to distract and replace it with something less crucial and less imperative. And to me, that's exactly what he did by adding redundant calculatory data. You see, the return survey data was a silver bullet to the accuracy of the rectilinear and proved beyond all doubt that indeed it was straight as an arrow and had no sag to it whatsoever. They returned the apparatus for three-eighths of a mile. Now if the airline continued to descend as it did forward on the return, then you could have concluded that the beams were sagging. But the beams did not descend on the return. They accurately measured the forward line, which meant they ascended in reverse. As a matter of fact, on the return survey data information provided by Morrow, on two separate intervals, the beams were shown to have microscopically ascended in deviation from the forward progression, shattering all speculation whatsoever of beam sagging. All right, I just watched Joseph Winthrop's video. He had an email correspondence with Donald Simonek, and I just want to bring up a few points before I play his video. My assertion is that Donald Simonek furtively and deceptively omitted the return survey data information from his critique of the rectilinear experiment. On the left you see the column that he posts on his website where he added this area here. It's really just redundancy, redundant calculations, which I believe were to deceptively hide or distract the reader from actually knowing that there's actually return data. This green box here, this is the return data that Simonek omitted. This is from Cellular Cosmog Cosmogony on page 123, and it shows conclusively that the beams did not sag. Uh, he mentions uh, a possibility of cooking data. Well, if anyone's cooking data, Mr. Simonek, it's you. You're cooking data by omitting data. Okay, the return survey, uh, after two and three eighths of a mile, they went back up back down to the two mile mark. And so if you look at the results here of the return survey, it shows them to be consistent. Okay. Um, at, two, at two miles here, we have a deviation of 30.62 inches. Okay. At two, eighths, in two, two and three eighths of a mile, we have a deviation of 48.25 inches. Okay. So on the return, they started at two and three eighths that's the 48.25. Two and one quarter goes 42.53. On the return, uh, the forward for two and one quarter is 42.68. Very close, very pretty much perfect. You're squaring the distance at the end of the survey, so the deviation is getting more extreme. <laughs> There's no way the beam sagged, Simonac. No way. Going down to two and one quarter, we have 42.5. 5.3 on the return, 42.68 on the forward, virtually the same. Two and one eighths on the return, we have 34.32 inches. Two and one eighths in the forward progression, 34.56. So this is the data that Simonek deceptively omitted from his critique of the rectilineator. And if he wants to continue to assert that the beam sagged without any evidence of that happening whatsoever, then he's not a true scientist. A true scientist would retest the rectilineator. Instead, he spent his time going down to the Crescent Unity and trying to find out, going through the archives and trying to find out uh, the data, Morrow's notes. So if he spent more time being a true scientist and not an investigative journalist, Mr. Simonek, I'd have more respect for you. Okay, so I had an email exchange with Donald Simonek and a lot of it had to do, <clears throat> excuse me, with Steve's claim of being the Christ. So I'm I'm only gonna bring up the points pertaining to the science. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. <clears throat> so he says, Joseph, thanks for the link to the readable image. Steve has added nothing to the to the question. We have the data for the Naples experiment in Teed's book and on my webpage, but we have none of the raw data and no data on any backtracking measurements. If Stephen has such, he should give references where they can be found. 
Alright, time out. It says right here in the graphic, page 103 slash 4, Saw Your Cosmogony, which is Teed's book. When, when Donald Tamanek says, uh, we have the data for the experiment in Teed's book, he's talking about Saw Your Cosmogony. So, on page 103 slash 4, the section was found to be in the same exact place as originally, with the hairline precisely over the fine line on the brass plate. So, uh, you could just read this on your own, and hopefully that will make sense to you, but they were required to backtrace it. So moving on, I have sought that information from the Koreshan Library Archives in the College of Life, but the staff there tell me that Moro's original notebooks, which might have such data, are lost. I was searching for the original raw data of Fro Moro's notebooks because one should be rightly suspicious that the data in Moro's book might have been cooked. Many have suggested that they must have been faked. I still cannot rule that out, but my own analysis suggests to me that Moro was honestly reporting the measurements he took and was likely unaware of the lack of rigidity of the six rectilinear sections. Alright. So, if if he's honestly reporting the measurements he took, why would the backtracking measurements be forged? That, that doesn't make sense to me. And the backtracking proved that the rectilinear was rigid. Because if they backtracked it and it wasn't rigid, then the beams would have sagged, like you conjecture. So, okay, and when he refers to the lost data, the supposed lost data, or, or when he says raw data, he's referring to the rough drafts, or the original first draft papers that they wrote their data on, onto. And the reason why we don't really need that anymore is because we have the final draft. We have all of the data in Teet's book that we need. So if they're going to be lying about the experiment, about one part of the experiment, then they're lying about the whole experiment. And in his own words, even on his website, he admits that he believes the data was not forged or cooked. So he believes they were honestly reporting the measurements and they did have skeptics on ground making sure that they weren't lying or cheating. The Koreshans even used a system of reversals to the beams themselves, alternating right side up to upside down, which neutralized any deviation favoring one direction over the other. There was even speculation by the critics that the standards may have sunk into the sand as the survey progressed. But once again, the return survey data shattered that conjecture. They were also required by the on-site Copernican Investigating Committee who, according to Morrow, we're doing all in their power to prove the instrument inaccurate, to perform a pre-survey test of 228 feet and return to the same spot. And after 456 feet, or twice that distance, there was zero deviation whatsoever. Not even one ten thousandth of an inch. Nada. Zilch. Can you imagine the feeling Ulysses felt after he laid and bolted that 19th final beam and saw the hairline perfectly return to the original etching in the plate? Just think of the engineering feat of accomplishment and precision this was. I highly doubt if anybody today can match this man's brilliance and geodesy. As expected from a biased Copernican operating in deception, Sneaky Simonac left out the return survey data and only gave a mere speculative glance at the preliminary test, alluding to those beams not sagging. Huh. This outraged me at first, because I knew he had committed a considerable amount of damage in keeping concave Earth reality a silly, innocuous, water-cooler discussion and talked about it all, and usually met with ridicule. Ironically, with his own confirmation bias, he even accuses the Crescens of having an expectation bias. He claims it was possible that the Crescens were just too exuberant in seeing that the line was descending to their liking that they misread the data, even though there was a skeptical committee watching every step they took. If that isn't desperate enough, laughably, he goes on to conclude that it just may be virtually impossible to determine the Earth's curvature with any sort of mechanical measuring instrument. I wonder if someone has ever told Simonek as a physicist, you suck. 
Hence my righteous anger is sometimes manifested in videos. I feel I need to fight these clowns of junk science to restore the honor of Teed and Moro. Once you see the efforts to cover up and omit results and to replace them with unscientific speculation and a jackass attitude considering retesting, you begin to realize the scope in which you have been deceived. But before I get too far ahead of myself, let's go back and start from the beginning, detailing all the proceedings of the rectilineator experiment. The location of the Crescent Geodetic Survey was over a straight patch of sand on Naples Beach, Florida, minutes from the Crescent Commune. The rectilineator experiment, invented by Morrow, was a geniusly simple apparatus consisting of giant 12-foot sectioned T-squares lining up together in a leapfrog procession over a long distance to form a perfectly straight air line. If done accurately, it would determine the direction of the curvature of the Earth, if any. In other words, if the initially leveled air line would continually rise the further down it went, the Earth would prove to be convex, just like the Copernican system proclaims. If the line continued at the same height, the Earth would be proven to be flat. And if the air line would show a continual descent from the initial station, the Earth would be proven to be concave. This test of the curvature of the Earth subverts any attempts by long-distance lasers or telescopic surveys. Although these other tests are good methods to determine Earth is not convex, the rectilineator has the advantage of forcing the line by a mechanical process to stay rigid throughout the survey. It doesn't allow the varying bending of light which has been proven to fluctuate throughout the day. Because of Florida's ever-rising water levels over the past 118 years since the survey, and because Naples Beach is a luxurious haven for the wealthy, the manicured beach of today looks slightly different than from the line illustrations that the Corrections provided. The survey started at the still-standing Naples Pier and extended southward for four and one-eighths of a mile. Two and three-eighths of those miles were measured with the rectilineator apparatus, and the remaining one and three-quarters of a mile were surveyed by line-of-sight telescope. There's a break in the beach called Gordon Pass, and directly behind the pass is a sandbar that needed to be excavated, or scooped out in order for the descending airline to pass through the sandbar and shoot the water at four and one-eighths of a mile, where a sailboat was cast off to be used as a reference point of the termination of the projected airline into the water. The preparations before the survey could actually begin were tedious and time-consuming. A full two months of the complete five-month-long project involved one, Conducting an initial coast survey with surveyor's instruments, which involved erecting a series of stakes on the beach along the water, equally spaced at one-eighth of a mile apart, creating a four and one-half mile long meridian line extending north to south. These stakes were to be used as reference points for the rectilineator, but also set the locations for the caissons, which I'll get into soon. Two, mild land excavation was necessary. The shoreline's elevation varies from about five feet at the pier to around three feet near the pass. But this proved to be a blessing for more on the corrections. Let me explain. Since the vertical standards of the apparatus were only eight feet tall, and the calculated amount of deviation after two and three eighths of a mile was over 48 inches, the apparatus would have had to start a good two feet higher than it actually did if the beach was level in elevation. But since the beach made a nice gradual two foot decline toward the south, Morrow could keep his beams at a comfortable height throughout the entire survey. Hence, the excavation could be simplified by simply smoothing out any small mounds of sand in the line and removing any debris. Three, four weeks were devoted to testing and adjusting right angles. According to Morrow, six series of tests were applied, and each section was reversed, end for end, and turned over 50 times on the special platform with the mechanical devices for measurement and reference points and the finest possible lines engraved on steel and brass plates, to which adjustments were referred, were read by means of the microscope. In this way, the very slightest variation of angles could be detected. And four, a series of tide registers would have to be erected in the water to find a consistent datum line. Now to compensate for the varying tidal waters, Morrill used perforated caissons, which allowed water in through small holes at the bottom. Attached to the caissons were tide staffs. The caissons stabilized the wavy water, which allowed accurate and consistent readings. Morrow states, the average of the tide levels on the Florida coast is about three and a half feet. The mean tide level is a point midway between high and low tide levels. It was necessary to ascertain this point 
with all possible precision, which we did by means of a tide register, consisting of a caisson with perforations and a tide staff measure set in the gulf so that its bottom was below the level of low tide and its top above the level of high tide. The perforations omitted the water from beneath at normal pressure and prevented wave fluctuations. Thus, the water in the caisson was perfectly still and only rose and fell with the gulf tide level. When the mean tide level was obtained, it was marked upon the stationary tide register and became the fixed point to which all other measurements of water level were referred. The vertical tide staff connected to the tide register on the caisson was used to project a datum line exactly 128 inches above mean tide level. Then the geodetic level was used to transfer an exact perpendicular line over to the corresponding stake on the beach. Since the mean tide level in the first stationary tide register became a known and fixed quantity, it was taken as the basis of reference for the measure of the airline at all station points along the line. To illustrate this process, we have the staffs on both the initial station register and any given portable register along the line. Line XY is the mean tide level, which is marked as a fixed point on staff A, the top of which is the altitude of 128 inches above the mean tide level, which also is transferred to the beach. They were then easily to record the same vertical altitude regardless of the fluctuating tides. Here's how. Say they were reading for a portable tide measurement two miles down, and the reading on the tide staff A is 12 inches above the mean tide level, leaving 116 inches of the staff sticking above the water. The line PQ is our 116 inch line. Now on staff B, they simply adjust its height to reach precisely 116 inches above the water line in the corresponding portable caisson. This was done instantaneously with Morse code, so the reading was perfectly accurate. In this way, no matter whether the measurements were taken at high tide or low tide, or at any water level between the two extremes, the results were accurate, because the fixed point at staff A was the constant and unvarying basis of reference. Finally, when the vertical altitude of staff B was ascertained, the corresponding vertical angle was transferred to the land elevation. There were 25 tide registers in all, spaced an eighth of a mile apart from the beginning to the end of the line, which when completed formed a line that was parallel to the water's surface. This hypsometric principle of ascertaining tidal secondary data lines, as opposed to the first being underwater at times, was scientific and accurate. But in order for this survey to function well, the initial section had to be perfectly level, for if it leaned either up or down, even the slightest, it would give an inaccurate reading down the line later. That's why so much time and redundant measures of scrutiny were taken to make sure the first beam was perfectly level. Morrow used the finest and most sensitive spirit levels obtainable. He also hung a plumb line over each side cross arm, and he created a custom-made 12 foot long mercurial level with fine-tuned accuracy. All three leveling procedures had to be in agreement with each other in order for the first section to be considered perfectly level. He also telescopically viewed the horizon as further corroboration and found it to be perfectly parallel with the clear-cut waterline of the Gulf. According to Morrow, the leveling was a careful, painstaking, successful work witnessed by every member of the staff and finally pronounced perfect at 8.50 on the morning of March 18, 1897. Because of the poor quality and the scant amount of photographs and illustrations of the mechanical part of the rectilineator, with some showing differences in appearance, it was difficult to precisely reconstruct it in 3D without taking some liberties of guesswork. But here's my version. Morrill states that the rectilineator consisted of a number of sections in the form of double T-squares, each 12 feet in length with braced and tensioned cross arms 4 feet in length. The material was one-inch mahogany, seasoned for 12 years in the shops of the Pullman Palace Car Company from Chicago. The horizontal bar was 8 inches in width and the cross arms 5 inches. He used steel tension rods marking an X across the entire section and extending through the extremities of the cross arms. They were adjusted to maintain the constancy of right angles. Finely trimmed brass facings at the extremities of the cross arms constituted the adjusting surfaces. Through flanges in the facing, ingenious screws were placed for securing the adjustments when made. Each section was supported by two strongly built platformed standards with adjustable castings to receive the horizontal sections between the body of the castings and 
adjustable cleats with clamps and set screws. The beams rested in the casting edgewise. The principle involved in its operation was as simple as the placing of two rectangular plates in contact, or laying two mechanics squares together. From the first to the last of the 1045 adjusted sections, the same procedure was methodically performed. Two standards were placed in front of the previous adjusted section and placing the castings at the approximate height. The new section was placed in position in the castings. Initially, they turned the set screws to raise or lower the horizontal axis to approximately the height of one of the middle brass lines of the previous beam. The brass facings were then brought to one quarter of an inch of contact. Operators of the set screws were directed to raise or lower the section to bring the hair lines exactly coincidental. Fine lines were read with the microscope, and the section was carefully moved horizontally by two set screw operators turning each screw in unison as the facings get to one fiftieth of an inch apart. Then a Bristol card is placed between each facing with equal friction to ensure exact spacing. When the same card passes through each facing top and bottom with equal friction, it proves that the adjustment is precise. Then finally, the two sections are bolted together at the two brass facings top and bottom with equal torque and the procedure is repeated. They had watchmen guarding the apparatus continually throughout each night to ensure no one tampered with it. As expected, because measuring the curvature of the Earth will happen in a logarithmic fashion, increasing exponentially toward the end of the survey, there wasn't any detectable deviation for the first few sections. But after that, it was a done deal. As soon as the airline showed consistent deviation in the descent, the sign of curvature of the Earth already could be determined. And it was, of course, concave. What still needed to be determined was if the amount of descent was consistent with the circumference of the Earth, and it was. After one mile, it measured 8.02 inches, only two one-hundredths of an inch away from an even eight inches. That, my friends, is the work of a genius. After two miles, it was still fairly close, 30.62 inches to the generally agreed 32 inches. And at the end of the survey, at two and three-eighths of a mile, the descent was 48.25 inches. At every twelfth adjustment, the spirit level was read. If the bubble began to deviate to the south, the earth would show to be convex, and if to the north, then concave. The bubble consistently rose to the north of the vial. The plumb line was also used, and hung over the four-foot vertical cross beams. In converse manner to the spirit level, if the bob shifted to the north, it would show convexity. But if to the south, then concavity. The plumb bob consistently shifted to the south again, further corroborating concavity. The 12-foot mercurial level would measure the angle of divergence within the length of the beam. This deviation would become more apparent at the end of the survey. Morrow also used the telescope to view the horizon from 15 feet behind the last section in the line. He noticed a continual sinking of the airline going below the horizon, which further proved the Earth was curving upward. There were three main measurements when all four of these appurtenances were used. One at one mile, one at two miles, and one at two and three-eighths of a mile. The results all agree in testimony of concavity. The remaining line of sight phase of the survey proved to show a fairly expected amount of descent as the airline passed through the excavated sandbar after Gordon passed to finally hit the water's surface. Morrill placed a steel horizontal strip at the height of the last recorded measurement protruding from stake 20 at the 2 and 3 eighth mile mark, then moved back his telescope to stake 19, 1 eighth of a mile away, where the heights of both markers were aligned to point through the excavated sandbar and wait for the bottom of the hull of the sailboat to line up. Through signaling, it was determined, and the crew on the boat calculated a 4 and 1 eighth mile distance from the stationary tide register. The survey was complete, and deemed a complete success. And the data speaks for itself. It wasn't tampered with. Even Simonek admits it appears genuine. And you begin to really see the lopsided victory for concavity when you take the numbers from the column distance of airline below secondary datum, 
or the amount in inches of deviation every one-eighth of a mile, and plot them on a graph. You see how accurately it matches the calculated amount of curvature to the Earth? It's truly a slam dunk victory and a silent testimonial witness of the fact that you are living inside the spherical concave Earth. To think that all this started with the vision that Koresh had of the concavity of the Earth. With the dissemination of this documentary, I believe he will finally get the respect and dignified honor he, as well as Ulysses Grant Morrow, so truly deserve. And on the contrary to the modern crackpot scientists and theoretical physicists of today, who operate in complete deception, I will do my best to make sure they are rightly shamed to compensate. If you have questions of how the concave Earth works, such as the horizon, why we can't see across to the other side, the orbits of the planets, moon, sun, the prodigious so-called distances and sizes of celestial bodies, the Coriolis effect, the solar analemma, the concept of the luminiferous ether and the fallacy of gravity, and so on. I recommend you watch some of my videos or visit the Concave Earth Forum, where everything is satisfactorily explained. In addition, the Concave Earth, unlike the convex or flat Earth, is the only model of the Earth that possesses no flaws to it. The process of bending sunlight up to the central celestial sphere is a tested reality. There is also a glass ball above our heads, the firmament, that utilizes negative refraction to invert your perception. This divine ruse is being revealed now more than ever as the modern conventional criminal scientist operating in deceit is being found out on a grand scale. We are on the verge of an explosion concave earth truth going mainstream as the people who are advocating a non-workable flat earth model are only one step away from joining me and helping me indelibly change humanity's perception of the world forever. In conclusion, I would like to present an offer to the honest and inquisitive minds of geodesy, the land surveyors, the geodesists, the architects, and the engineers. Make it a priority to conduct your own rectilineator experiment. The time to conclusively settle this matter, ubiquitously, is so overdue. Nothing would please me more than if there were at least a dozen separate rectilineator experiments performed on every continent of the world, and having them all conclusively agree with each other that the curvature of the Earth is concave. If you have that desire, and the initiative and the resources to resolve the matter, I implore you to do it. There's a trick of the eye Due to the crystal ball in the sky You bought a lie You were told you were on the outside This is news to you Your leaders have misled you Cause they have known all this time They know you're on
Cause they proved it all a lie They proved we are all in 